how to please God. Everybody wants God's approval. Everybody wants to know, is God pleased with me? When he looks at me, is he happy with what he sees? There is a way to know if he's pleased with you or not. And we're going to jump into that. Let's look at it. Hebrews 11, 6. It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Just before that, I talked about a man named Enoch who pleased God. He walked by faith and God took him up to heaven. He disappeared and people were looking for him like, where is this guy? God took him to heaven because he was so pleased with him. Now, God is going to take all believers to heaven with him. And the reason why he's going to do that is because like Enoch, they have pleased God with their faith. Now, how do you know if you have faith? Well, faith has to be given to you. Check this out. Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. So what he's talking about is saving faith. Saving faith has to be given to you by God's grace. Grace is getting something that you do not deserve. What is this something that God gave us that we did not deserve? Saving faith. Yesterday, I was at Walmart and I was with my oldest son and he had trouble getting out of my truck because the door handle was kind of weird. It's an old Japanese truck. And so he couldn't figure it out. And I was standing outside of his door waiting for him. He was pounding on the door. I can't get out, I can't get out. I was like, whoa, well, calm down, calm down, just do this. And I opened the door and I showed him how to do it. And I got frustrated with him because he was like making this big scene and it was like 6 a.m. And I was like, dude, no, just this is how you open the door. And so I closed it again and then he got it. We went into Walmart, got our stuff, and then we came back out and it was time to get out of the car again at Target. And he opened the door perfectly by himself. And I was like, oh, good job, great. And he looked at me and he goes, yeah, if you teach me, I'll know how to do it. <sighs> Or if you teach me, I'll do it. And he gave me a little bit of attitude, but it's because I was being rude to him. I got way too frustrated with him um, when I should have been more patient. I needed, I wanted to just get in Walmart and get out and get our stuff. Fathers get upset with their kids. It happens all the time. But fathers must show their kids the things that put a smile on that father's face. I can't just get upset with him when he does not know. And God is not going to get upset with you just be, you know, because you don't just know. You're completely ignorant of how to please Him. He has given you everything you need to please Him. And that's saving faith. By grace, He's given you exactly what you need to please Him. John Piper says this, that he is mo we are most satisfied in Him when He is most glorified in us. The most satisfying feeling is glorifying God, pleasing God. There's nothing more satisfying than that. He's given you everything to do that. But the question is, why does it feel like I'm not doing that? How come I don't feel like I'm pleasing God? How come I'm not satisfied in Him? How come I'm not walking in the saving faith that He has given me? Given me? Check this out, James 2, 17. Faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. So you may have saving faith, but the faith that God has given you, it might have, it might has, maybe it's died. Maybe it's dead. Maybe the faith that you have is dead and not working. Why? It's not accompanied by action. There has to be action accompanying your faith to know it's real, to know it's alive, to know it's working. Has God given you faith? And at first you had action, action with it and now it's dead. Now it's, it's passed away. How do we revive that faith so that we can please God? Because again, without that faith, it's impossible. Hebrews 12 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Why Jesus? Because he's the pioneer and the perfecter of our what? Faith, saving faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Isn't that what we all wanna do? We wanna sit down next to God. We wanna sit with him. The Bible says we will sit with him as co-heirs with Christ. Christ is sharing his, his glory, his throne with us by saying, you're gonna be my co-heir, my brother and my sister, you're gonna heir with me. 
The inheritance of God is going to come to me and to you as co-heirs. But why is he the perfecter of our faith? Because he did that. Because for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was he doing? He was perfecting our faith. He was also doing this. He endured the cross. He scorned the shame. Don't you see? He lived out perfectly what you and I are called to live out with our saving faith. He lived it out perfectly. And so if you want your faith to be revived, if you want your faith to work, if you want our faith, you know, to be the type of faith that pleases God, we have to keep our eyes on him. We have to focus on him. Last story. This hit me because I was reading in Samuel when David and his army, they were coming back to Judah and the Amalekites had wiped out Judah, took their wives and their kids and their stuff while they were gone. And God said, and God said to David, go hunt them down. You're going to get back everything that they stole. So David goes, he takes his men with him. And on the way, there is an Egyptian boy in the desert, so close to death. And they gave him water, they gave him food and his strength returned to him. He was almost dead. And they said, which way do the Amalekites go? Who are you? And he said, I'm actually a servant of one of the Amalekites. And my master left me here because I was sick. And so David said, take us to them. And he said, I'll take you to them as long as you don't make me go back to my master. And I love that because that Egyptian boy is a picture of us lost in this world, departed from God, uh, a slave to the master of sin, the master of wickedness, a slave to our own sin, a slave to things that were killing us, thing, things that were making our life horrible. And here comes our David, Jesus, who comes and gives us spiritual food, spiritual drink, lifts us up, returns our strength. And he says, I'm not going to send you back to your master. You're going to be with us from now on. He brings you into his family, brings you into his army and says, you're one of us now. You're a part of us. You're not going back to that master. You're not going back that way. You're going to be with us from now on. That Egyptian boy, as he was taking David to the Amalekites, his eyes were fixed on David. This guy that came and saved him, changed his life, freed him from slavery. If we are going to have the type of faith that pleases God, we have to keep our eyes on our David, on the author and the finisher of our faith, the perfecter of our faith. Keep your eyes on him. What does that mean? Try to see him in everything because he's he his fingerprints in everything. When you hear the birds, when you see the trees, when you listen to the ocean, when you uh, are walking and driving and, and see a smile on a baby's face, think about the Lord. Say, what does this teach me about Jesus? How does this keep my eyes on Jesus? All throughout the Bible, when you're reading, say, well, okay, what does this have to do with Jesus? How does this help me see Jesus more clearly? How does, I don't know, if you go to the zoo or something, you go and look at animals, say, how does this teach me about Jesus? Keeping your eyes, fixing your eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith. Love you guys. See you in the next one. Check out Amen Podcasts if you want to hear more messages like this.